Now Mary has been a professional working in her field for most of her life in various capacities, gaining a broad range of experience. And part of that experience was to bring her into the University of Wyoming and say, what is somebody who is an expert, an experienced expert in what you do, what do you have to teach our students? How can they learn how to do the kinds of things and be interested in the kinds of things that you are interested in? And so Mary was brought in as a professor in the American Studies program where she's focused on uh, architectural history, historical preservation, and sustainability. She's taught at both the undergraduate and the graduate levels. Uh, despite uh, not having quite the standard sort of bachelor's degree to PhD degree kind of training. Um, but she's had lots of years, decades of professional experience. She worked for the National Trust of Historic Preservation as the assistant director of the Denver, R uh, Denver office. Uh, she, while doing that, she developed and ran many national programs, including the well-known Barn Again program, uh, which had helped people adapt old barns for new uses. Uh, she spent many years as the head of her own consulting company, and she even spent a year in Japan working uh, with the historic preservations of Japanese uh, buildings and their very different uh, needs and requirements uh, and shapes uh, from American um, buildings. Mary has worked most extensively and recently with Sheridan College to help put Spiro Wigwam Mountain Campus on the National Historic Register. And as I said, we will have a short uh, ceremony at the end to commemorate that. But right now, I'd like to ask Mary Humstone to come and talk about place, memory, and preservation from Independence Hall to Spiro Wigwam. Mary. Thank you. I'm really not nervous about speaking to you all. It's just that I've been shivering ever since I got up here <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> and I can't decide, you know, jacket, no jacket. The jacket may come off. Um, so I first want to thank uh, Northern Wyoming Community College District and Sheridan College for having the vision to acquire this incredible place, Spiro Wigwam, and open it up to the public uh, for events like this and to take such good care of it. You know, um, a lot of us, I lived in Story for a long time and spent a lot of time in the Bighorns and, and a lot of people even I've talked to this morning have said, oh yes, I you know, drove by this place many times on my way up to Coffeen Park to go backpacking or horse packing or something, but never came in and you know, you wouldn't have a chance to be sitting in this incredible space unless you were a dude. But now everybody can come here and enjoy this and I just think it's such a wonderful community resource and uh, it's so great for an uh, educational institution to realize how important it is to get off of campus sometimes and to get into another environment. And I had had the pleasure of teaching field classes at the University of Wyoming uh, Research Center in Grand Teton National Park, uh, the AMK Ranch, which is a similar kind of situation, and it really, I mean, it just works so well, so thank you. Um, I also just want to make a really quick uh, announcement. Paul mentioned earlier that the Alliance for Historic Wyoming is sponsoring a log workshop, so speaking about taking good care of buildings. Uh, we have an expert, Harrison Goodall, uh, from Washington State, who's going to show how to take good care of historic log buildings. And I know a lot of you are already registered for that, but if there's some people who would like to stick around for a few hours this afternoon and, uh, and join us on this workshop, you can talk to Director Carly Ann Anderson, and she will register you for the workshop. Starts at 1.30. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about place again, but uh, in this case, I'm talking about more of our built environment than our natural environment. Um, and so my slide lecture 
this morning. It's about historic preservation and um, how we got from Independence Hall to Sparrow Wigwam. So this is about 200 years of historic preservation <laughs> history squeezed into 45 minutes. Um, you all have to take notes really quickly. Um, one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about historic preservation is the fact that what gets preserved is what gets remembered. So the physical reality, seeing the, the physical feature is what we tend to remember, whether it's a, a building or whether it's a landscape or a trail. And so throughout history, we've had a struggle among people to, to determine whose story gets told, what places get preserved, and thus whose story gets told and what gets remembered. So this is a political movement as well as a social and cultural movement. So I'm going to start my brief history here um, of historic preservation with Independence Hall. And when uh, Independence Hall was built as for the uh, colonial legislature, and when um, Pennsylvania moved the capital to Harrisburg and Independence Hall was no longer needed, uh, the city of Philadelphia bought this building for, uh, they're gonna tear it down and sell it off for building lots. Uh, of course, this is the place where the Declaration of Independence was debated, where the first Constitutional Convention was held, uh, basically the birthplace of our country. But um, people weren't really thinking about that. Fortunately, there were a group of um, patriots and, and uh, people kind of aware of the importance of this history and they petitioned the city to save the building and, and of course it has been saved and it's now part of the National Park uh, System, uh, Independence uh, National Historic Park. Um, so that was 1816 that, that this building was saved um, and you know it's not that surprising uh, when you've think of how young our country was at that time. I mean, such a young country, we're looking forward, we're not necessarily looking backward. We had very little visible past to preserve. So, and, and there weren't that many physical reminders of uh, traditions. Well, we didn't really want traditions. You know, we want to strike out new. So, so it's not really surprising, but um, it's certainly, uh, we're thankful that some people uh, had the foresight to preserve this building. Um, with a few exceptions over the next 40 or so years, there really wasn't a whole lot um, significant in, in terms of historic preservation. Uh, there were a few uh, monuments preserved to, for um, the revolution and, and places like that. But we usually think of the start of the historic preservation movement as um, being the preservation of Mount Vernon in Virginia, George Washington's home. So here's the story. George Washington died in 1799 and his wife Martha died a few years later and um, they didn't have any children and so the, their property, this house and the farm which he had inherited from his father and he was very, very into farming as, as you may know um, and had a very uh, progressive and uh, successful farm uh, but his relatives were not quite as good at it as he was and so the farm really fell into disrepair, uh, the soils were depleted, the, they weren't making any money, and of course the building was, as you can see, was in pretty uh, sad shape. So the owner wanted to sell the building, uh, wanted to sell the farm, but did not want it torn down. So he actually turned down a proposal from a developer uh, to buy the property tear down Mount Vernon, build a replica of Mount Vernon as a hotel and make it a tourist attraction. So this kind of proposal was going on even you know 160 years ago, it's amazing. Um, but uh, so the owner turned that down. He pe petitioned the state of Virginia to um, purchase this and they said no, he petitioned Congress. No, Congress wasn't interested in this, but this woman, Anne Pamela Cunningham, in 1853, 
um, saw Mount Vernon from a trip on the Potomac River and thought it was just a disgrace that the home of our founding, our first president, um, was in that kind of condition. And so she appealed to the ladies of the South to save Mount Vernon. And there they are. This is the Mount Vernon Ladies Association of the Union. This is the first, uh, it was a private organization of women with vice regents from every state. This is really the first historic preservation organization. And they wrote to newspapers, they made speeches. Um, a lot of times they had to have men make the speeches for them because they weren't really supposed to be out speaking in public, but uh, they wrote the speeches and they raised money from women all over the country and eventually in 1858 they purchased Mount Vernon uh, for $200,000 which can you imagine how much that is I mean I can't even conceive of it um, and the organization has been running it ever since so the federal government changed their mind and tried to buy it back and they said nah and so the state of Virginia tried to buy it back no uh, so the Mount Vernon ladies uh, still run this and the Mount Vernon experience really established uh, certain assumptions about preservation that continued for a long time. And the basic one um, was that it's appropriate and patriotic to preserve buildings and sites associated with political and military figures. Um, it's up to citizens to, if they want to preserve, it's up to citizens to preserve historic sites that the government is not going to do it. And it's an appropriate role for women. Um, at this time, women really couldn't get involved in business, uh, in politics. Uh, they were considered, it was a period when they were really considered the keepers of, of family morals and traditions. And uh, so, so historic preservation in this patriotic sense really fit into that idea of um, you know, preserving our traditions, preserving our, uh, our morals. And so it gave women an opportunity opportunity really to get involved in, um, in society and, and as I said it really was political because when you save something it, people remember it. Um, Cunningham also gave us a, a blueprint for uh, citizen activism. I mean a group gets together, they recruit like-minded individuals, they raise money, they petition government and in the end we hope they are successful in preserving a place and uh, either run it themselves or turn it over to the government or sell it to someone to use for an another use. So this Mount Vernon story is also a great example of this cultural politics of preservation. Um, controlling the built environment is important to controlling the message because this was going on just as the Civil War was heating up and so it was felt like it was very important to preserve this the home of the first president in order to make a statement that about the country, about the Union. And actually both sides in the Civil War uh, left Mount Vernon alone. It was also why Abraham Lincoln decided to continue the renovation of the Capitol, U.S. Capitol building during the Civil War because he wanted people to know that he intended that this country would endure. So this is him uh, giving his inauguration speech in front of the Capitol while it was under construction. This uh, Mount Vernon story was repeated after, after the uh, Mount Vernon Ladies Association. This Mount Vernon story was repeated hundreds of times uh, throughout the country at the local level um, in the preservation of the homes of founders, uh, even the homes of uh, local, prominent local citizens. And this was especially important to Southerners after the Civil War. The first statewide organization was started in 1889. It was the Association for the Preservation of uh, Virginia Antiquities. And it was founded by families whose wealth and social status were threatened. Uh, they wanted to create these physical reminders of who they were, what values they stood for. Um, they wanted to reestablish their identity. And 
This is uh, Stratford Hall, the home of Robert E. Lee, and this kind of statement is exactly what people were saying, you know, a hundred more years ago in preserving these homes. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. This is um, from you know, their, their website today, and uh, it's still that kind of same sentiment. The culmination of uh, this idea of preservation is creating a shrine to the past, what is Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, this is our probably the most famous and, and uh, most popular, anyway, preservation project. So Williamsburg was begun in 1926 by John D. Rockefeller, who quietly bought up properties in Williamsburg. He had architects apparently measuring buildings at night so that people wouldn't suspect anything. You know, we in Wyoming know all about John D. Rockefeller, you know, secretly buying up property, uh, as he did for Grand Teton National Park. Very effective. Um, and Williamsburg opened in 1934. Uh, Rockefeller's state intention was that Williamsburg would tell the story of the quote patriotism high purpose and unselfish devotion of our forefathers to the common good it's been called the single most influential historic preservation project in US history um, it's wildly popular although I understand that now it's not exciting enough and they have to have a Knott's Berry farm and these other attractions nearby to you know really provide entertainment um, but uh, the thing that was new about Williamsburg was that it was not just a building here or there but it was a whole environment and uh, including living history so so people you know are dressed up in costume etc um, Wash Rockefeller's team chose a cutoff date of 1775 that was the year that the capital of Virginia moved to Richmond and restored everything to that one date which is an interesting concept because if you think about it that creates something that actually never existed um, about 700 buildings that were built after 19, or I keep saying that, after 1775 were destroyed. There were 88 buildings built before 1775 that were kept, but anything added onto them after 1775 was demolished. And then 350 structures were reconstructed. So, um, and they were reconstructed based on, uh, not on blueprints or anything like that, but basically mostly on, on conjecture. So the governor's palace is one of them, the governor's palace, the capitol, the courthouse, houses, taverns, gardens, um, all of this uh, reconstructed. So Williamsburg has, has been criticized both for the, the fact that its reconstructions aren't actually authentic um, and for the fact that it uh, only really told one side of the story. Uh, colonial life, you know, was very, very clean and everybody was white and, you know, that's, that's what you would see in, in, at Williamsburg, although it has changed. Uh, so it's come under some criticism, but it's still a major milestone in terms of historic preservation in this country. And interestingly, there's still a lot of research going on and going back, and so people, they're acknowledging, oh yes, you know, this, this building, the way we did this, is, is totally wrong. Um, one thing that Williamsburg did not do was to motivate people to go back to their own communities and preserve buildings in their own communities. By taking the buildings out of their social and cultural context, uh, Williamsburg made them into basically artifacts, uh, like museum artifacts, and so people didn't necessarily relate Williamsburg to their own communities. What it did do is inspire uh, quite a few other kind of copycat uh, building collections. This is Henry Ford's Greenfield Village. Uh, there's Old Sturbridge Village and uh, Deerfield Village in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And um, 
So again, these are kind of co just collections of historic buildings, often brought from other places and, and put, made up into a little community. Again, buildings, nice buildings, interesting to go see, but they're artifacts, they're not really part of, of the uh, community context or the urban context. We later started calling these building zoos. <laughs> and historic context is what I want to address next. And a great example, kind of our first example of a building saved because of urban context and architecture is the Massachusetts State House in Boston. This was designed, built in 1795, uh, designed by Charles Bullfinch. Bullfinch was a um, very, very fine federal style architect in Boston. He designed um, a lot of buildings, a lot of beautiful townhouses, and the Massachusetts State House was probably his, his finest uh, design, uh, certainly biggest building that was built. Uh, after 100 years, the legislature outgrew the State House, and so around uh, 1895 they decided that they needed a new building. So they probably should demolish the old state house and build a new building. Well, um, this got the attention of a lot of people. People who really liked the design of that building, its place on Beacon Hill, the way it fit into the urban context. Uh, architects who had not necessarily been all that involved in historic preservation, the American Institute of Architects, for example, really got involved in this and, and recognized the, the beauty of this building, not only its beauty of this, but its significance in architectural history and how it had influenced other buildings over the next 100 years. Um, so this idea, this proposal to tear down the Massachusetts State House stimulated a lot of discussion about, you know, okay, people were acknowledging, yes, this is an architectural landmark, but we need a bigger building for our legislature to meet. So, what do you do? Do you tear down this building? Do you build a new, build a new building? Can you put an addition on this building? Another idea that was floated was why don't we build a replica of this building in, bigger and in new materials so that it will last longer? And the idea behind that was, well, if this is just important as a design, is something that this architect designed, then what is the difference? Do we need the, is this as the actual artifact or couldn't we just you know, take his plans and design another one? And as I said, in, in newer materials so it'll last longer. Um, so, yeah, so is, is it really an idea that we're preserving or is it the actual artifact? And interestingly, uh, these are important preservation issues that are still being discussed today. And particularly, there's this, um, you know, a lot of interest in intangible heritage. Well, if you're talking about intangible heritage, you don't necessarily need the physical artifact to, you know, walk into. On the other hand, if you, you know, I like the idea of, you know, being in this space where dudes used to sit around the fire and swap stories. That, so, and, and to realize that other people have been in this space and it has, it has a certain history to it just, just by virtue of having been here for uh, this many years. So anyway, uh, interesting discussions as that, as I said, are still going on today. There, there's the Massachusetts State House. They have proposed this annex here and um, a little bit overpowering, but, but that was kind of the, the, uh, the proposal that people liked okay. In the end, this is how they built it with the, the addition kind of back behind and uh, subservient to the front of the building, which is, um, a, you know, I think in terms of historic preservation, a, a great practice. And uh, it's a beautiful building today and still has it, that wonderful place in the whole urban design. Quick question. Yes. How did they end up doing the, the front part here as far as artifact versus? It's all, it's all the original material, just restored, yeah. Um, 
So this, this idea of preservation as part of the, the urban context fit in very well with the progressive reforms of the early 20th century. Uh, the World's Columbia Exposition in Chicago in 1893 um, was the first introduction that people had of this idea of, of creating an urban space that was beautifully designed and planned that included <coughs> public spaces, plazas, reflecting pools, um, all of this public space and institutions all tied together with this classical architectural theme. And um, People went crazy over this, and you can imagine why. I mean, everybody was flocking to the, see the white city, as they called it. Well, if you think about what cities were like in the late 1800s, congested, dirty, just, you know, not well planned, um, kind of, you know, it, this just was, you know, incredibly peaceful and beautiful. And we were, you know, most of our cities did not allow for a lot of public space as well. So having this public space, this classical architecture, really appealed to people. The Chicago Exposition and the progressive reforms of the early 20th century uh, together contributed to the rise of the City Beautiful movement. And uh, the idea behind City Beautiful was, again, to, to create public spaces um, and to tie monuments and institutions buildings into that public space and uh, so in in the case of Denver, there's the 1890s uh, State Capitol building, and in the 1920s, this was incorporated into Civic Center Park, which included other institutional buildings, the City Hall, uh, the Public Library, and all of this with um, fountains and, and park space. One more, please. And, uh, and then everything tied together, again, with that, that classical theme. Um, and this was all part of a strategy during the progressive era of creating more you know, healthy environments for people to live in and incorporating city planning into uh, the urban context. So this is generally the way that we think about historic preservation today. So I'm just, you know, coming along from the, you know, preserving the monument of the founder to a broader thinking about, you know, it, it, our past, our architectural heritage, our urban heritage, and how we can take that and use it to create um, more livable uh, communities, basically. Okay, um, now we'll go to Devil's Tower, and uh, because Devil's Tower is um, here to represent the federal government. Uh, during all this time, the federal government has been noticeably absent from having any role in historic preservation. As I said, it was really a, a totally private movement. Um, and Interestingly, when the federal government did finally get involved in historic preservation, it started in the West. Um, and there was pressure on Congress in the early 1900s to enact some legislation to protect uh, federal property, particularly the looting of prehistoric sites in the Southwest. And so this led to the passage of the Antiquities Act of 1906. Um, this was really significant in that it recognized um, it wasn't to protect the homes of patriots or founders. It was to protect um, specifically prehistoric um, and, and historic sites, but you know, not necessarily just associated with the revolution. Um, it authorized the president to designate national monuments within um, federal lands for uh, preservation and um, for pre federal protection, um, authorize the government to accept donations of private land for national monuments, but not to acquire private land in any other way. And the first monument designated under the act was the uh, Devil's Tower in 1906. Okay. Um, 
In 1916, 10 years later, uh, the National Park Service was set up as a separate uh, unit within the Department of Interior and given responsibility for the national parks, the national monuments, and the Federal Historic Preservation Program, which didn't really exist at that time. But so we're celebrating this year. I'm sure nobody could have missed it, the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. Um, so, Again, the federal government begins to recognize in the early 1900s uh, that it has a role in protecting and preserving uh, American heritage. Not a whole lot happened uh, between the, the founding of the Park Service or um, establishment of that and the Depression. Uh, but in 1933, the National Park Service established the Historic American Building Survey. Um, that was established as a New Deal program, and it put architects and photographers to work recording historic buildings. So they did measured drawings of buildings, they took photographs, historians wrote about the history of buildings. Um, we still have these teams working today. They don't look like that at all, <laughs> but we do. In fact, we have uh, students going out every, every summer doing the, we call them HABs, Historic American Building Survey, um, and now there are 35,000 um, of these uh, records of our architecture heritage. Uh, the idea was to record these buildings before they're demolished, of course, thinking, of course, they're going to be demolished. Um, and they were designed to document all kinds of buildings, so monumental buildings, but everyday buildings as well, and to give a complete picture of the culture of the times as reflected in the buildings of the period. So it's an incredible resource that we have. It's actually, uh, almost all of these are online and they're housed in the Library of Congress. Um, in the process of, of this HABS uh, development of this program, we learned a lot about how to record buildings. Um, you know, we have kind of blueprints for uh, what a good uh, building assessment looks like, what a good building record, building photographs, uh, building histories, and so forth. In 1935, Congress passed the Historic Sites Act, and this was our first attempt at an actual National Historic Preservation Program. Uh, the act declared it was national policy to preserve for public use historic sites, buildings, and objects of national significance for the inspiration and benefit of the people of the United States. So finally, a, an acknowledgement that there is a, a good reason why we might want to preserve this, this range of buildings. Um, also, in this case, um, the Park Service with the Historic Sites Act went beyond just federally owned property to go out and do a survey of important places throughout the country, but with the intention that these would be, um, they added eventually to the national park system. So it's kind of interesting um, that the Tom Sun Ranch in Wyoming, it was the first site actually designated under the Historic Sites Act, even though it wasn't designated until 1959. It was part of a, a survey of the West of uh, early ranches, and going from Texas up to Wyoming and up to Montana, and identifying ones that, that still existed at the time, and that might be, I'm not sure what they had in mind, a whole bunch of string of national parks or what, but anyway, but this was to um, identify these, and so all of these uh, sites that were listed under the Historic Sites Act are now known as National Historic Landmarks. Soon after World War II ended, um, in 1949, Congress did a couple of things, uh, passed a couple of bills, two bills that had a huge impact on historic preservation. Uh, one was positive, one was negative. Uh, in 1949, Congress chartered the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and this was in order to facilitate more public involvement in pre uh, preservation of historic buildings. So, um, 
again, the federal government knew it had this responsibility to preserve, all of a sudden, you know, did this site survey, realized, wow, there are a lot of places out there that we think are important, and who's gonna do all this? The government can't do it all. So the National Trust was chartered to kind of organize the, the private sector to get involved in historic preservation. And to start off with, they mostly um, bought historic houses and opened them to the public. I think there's one more of those. But eventually, the, the trust got involved really in trying to develop a grassroots advocacy network um, and to help people at the local and state level to uh, preserve the places that matter to them. Now, the second bill, I mentioned two bills in 1949, the second one was um, the Housing Act of 1949, which basically called for slum clearance and um, urban renewal. So, so this act, coupled with a number of different trends after World War II, resulted in the demolition of thousands and thousands of historic buildings. And um, in, in many cases leaving, as you know, just leaving empty, empty space in its wake. At the same time, there are so many cartoons from the 1960s about buildings falling on people's heads and stuff. But um, yeah, buildings were just coming down all over the place. Uh, at the same time as urban renewal, we have a lot of moving out, suburbanization, moving out into the suburbs. So San Jose, for example, built this brand new, in 1958, um, city hall complex way outside of the downtown area. They abandoned their 1888 city hall. And so this is playing out all over the country, that abandonment of the older residential neighborhoods, abandonment of downtowns, moving out into the suburbs. Highways, I mean, just like this, cutting right through the center of historic neighborhoods and uh, historic downtowns with an impenetrable you know, ribbon of highway. Uh, so this also not only destroyed all the buildings in its path, but also ruined what was on either side because there's no more connection back and forth. No building was important enough or beautiful enough to escape the wrecking ball. In, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but I have an idea. Let's tear down one of the most beautiful structures in New York and replace it with something really crappy. It'll take a lot of time and cost a fortune, but it'll be worth it. Um, the demolition of Pennsylvania Station in New York, I think, finally galvanized people uh, to, to take action. And this combined with, with a number of other um, terrible losses that we suffered. And uh, there's architect Philip Johnson, um, a lot of important people came out to protest as well as a lot of regular folks. And so eventually all of these losses resulted in a, in a movement. And this is the same thing that's going on at the same time with the environmental movement. And so, you know, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring had its equivalent in preservation with Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which talked about this loss of the urban uh, context. Eventually, organizations such as the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and its new kind of grassroots advocacy began to put pressure on Congress uh, for national recognition and uh, to, to kind of stop this trend of, of destruction. And uh, the National Historic Preservation Act was um, uh, passed in 1966, so another anniversary we're celebrating, 50th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act. There's nothing more interesting than hearing about laws, right? <laughs> um, this is where I usually lose all my, my students, but to me it's really exciting to you know, finally see an official statement that the preservation of this irreplaceable heritage is in the public interest. Um, this acknowledgement that what we were doing was 
not, we were not going in the right direction in terms of recognizing what we have, what we'd inherited from the past, and taking steps to preserve it, that we're actually making it really easy to, to just destroy all of that. Um, and acknowledging that while citizens you know, bear the brunt of responsibility for this, there's a role for the federal government in being a leader in uh, preserving this, this heritage that belongs to all of us. Another important thing about this act is, is they weren't just uh, recommending, you know, let's add more buildings to the national park system or, or preserving more monuments, but really um, making sure that we preserve these places in order to enrich our cities and towns and make them part of the urban fabric. The, the National Historic Preservation Act set up the framework for having a national register of historic places. I've, I've worked in a number of, of other countries in, in preservation. And I'm always really proud of our National Register because our National Register does not only recognize those national landmarks that are significant to the entire country, but we also recognize significance on the state and local level. And so it gives us such a rich mix of buildings and building types that we you know, recognize as historic and want to preserve and, and kind of become a part of, our, part of our place, part of our lives, part of our environment. Down, you know, just a downtown, this Front Street in Laramie and Railroad District in Sheridan, so just a um, working class neighborhood, Sunrise Mine, an old industrial mining site, a farmstead, a vacation property in Grand Teton National Park. All of these are examples of, of what's on the National Register and, and not just individual buildings, districts. This Sunrise Mine is 225 acres, this, you know, a whole farmstead. So really expanding, you know, what, what we recognize as, as being important. We have gone on in preservation to, to really start thinking more about just ordinary buildings. The Barn Again program is a program uh, with a farm magazine, Successful Farming, to help farmers take their historic barns and put them back to work on the farm and preserve that thing that is so important on our landscape uh, but is so difficult to use in today's agriculture. Next. And then the Main Street program, which has been going on since the 1970s, live and well in Wyoming right now, uh, again, to recognize those downtowns that were all deserted after World War II, and people are coming back to them now. Uh, another thing that I think is a very important development in historic preservation is the fact that we can recognize places that show the darker side of our history. So at first it was, you know, the things that we were very, very proud of. But there are also things that are important in our history that we're not so proud of, like the internment camps uh, from Japanese internment camps from World War II. And again, um, who, you know, who preserves a place gets to tell the story. Uh, there have been a lot of people all over, over the country who have worked hard and petitioned to get these internment camps recognized as national historic landmarks, um, not because they're really fun places to go, or they have beautiful buildings on them, but because they tell a really important chapter of our history that people don't want us to forget and uh, don't want us to repeat. I think one other thing that people have been realizing, you know, in the last few decades, and certainly works with the, the Main Street program and so forth, is, is just that we have, with globalization, so many places are the same. Um, within our own country, so many places just look the same. You don't know where you are. Um, you got off the plane and you could be anywhere. So historic buildings are what give us that, um, I mean, they are, they are, each one is unique. Each community is different. Um, so they're what give us some kind of sense of, uh, not only of our history, but of how we are different from other places. And I think that's why it's so 
wonderful to have a place like Sparrow Wigwam and a building, I mean, who would have thought I'd be giving a talk in a building that looks like a spear? I mean, it's just kind of, it, it, the architecture here is, is just so amazing. And um, you can't go out and say, hey, I want a mountain campus. Um, you know, you can go build a mountain campus today, but you would not have something like this that has this history going back almost 100 years, all of the people who have been here, all of the stories, and the buildings themselves. Um, okay, so before 1966 in the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, this place probably would not have been deemed worthy of preservation. It might not have occurred to the owners to maintain and preserve cabins built in the 1920s, except maybe the cabin you see down there, which is the Hemingway cabin. So famous person, no, oh, yeah, but, but not, maybe not all the other cabins. Um, so just quickly, a little history. Um, Spear Wigwam was built in, by Willis Spear, a local rancher, in uh, 1923 and 1924. And uh, so here's a early picture of the place. You'll see how uh, there are very few trees. There was a huge uh, tree die-off in this area about 1920. And um, they built the, so they built the cabin and the lodge from, from Deadfall. He opened it as a fishing camp at first. He had a uh, dude ranch down in Bighorn, and he would bring people up to Spiro Wigwam to get more of a mountain experience. And then he changed his cow camp lease with the Forest Service to allow it to be a tourist lease and built the cabins and opened this camp. Well, it was very successful. This was in the uh, golden age of dude ranching. And um, in 1931, Spears' daughter took over and she saw the need to expand the lodge. Uh, so this is what is now the kitchen. This uh, Willis Spear designed as what he called the council lodge. So the eight-sided lodge had a fireplace in the center and uh, the fire just was open and just vented up through the cupola and the roof. So he, it was really based on the um, Crow Indian teepees. So, and he had rugs hanging on the walls and, and so forth. And the idea was that this was a place where people would come and gather after their day of horseback riding or fishing or whatever they had been doing and get together, enjoy a meal together, sing songs, drink some whiskey, listen to stories of the Old West. That was the wigwam part. Um, in 1931, they added on the shaft of the arrow and the spears, creating um, a building version of the, the family brand. I love this photo because you can really see this this whole shape here. And it's uh, almost almost reminds me of the roof of the Denver Airport. Or something. <laughs> uh, it doesn't quite in the metal. It, you know, it's a lot stiffer. But okay. So fortunately, the Spear family sold the property. Uh, they stopped running the, the dude ranch and sold it in the 1940s. And it had a number of different owners that continued to run dude ranches here until 2002. Fortunately, when the last owner decided to sell the property, uh, Northern Wyoming Community College District uh, bought it and uh, for their mountain campus. Um, as I said earlier, it's, I believe, a really smart move. Uh, this incredible site in the Bighorn Mountains with uh, a historic place with a lot of meaning both for local people and beyond. So today we're celebrating the listing of Spear Wigwam Mountain Campus on the National Register of Historic Places. We're also ex um, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so, I thought in the last few minutes I wanted to just say what it means to be listed on the National Register. Um, it's quite, it's quite a process, um, but the nomination to the National Register of Historic Places, first of all, National Register is our national list of buildings, sites, and objects that are significant in American history and culture. And 
so in order to nominate a property, um, one needs to do a, a very detailed history and be able to say, why is this significant in American history and culture. Uh, in the case of Spiro Wigwam, it is significant first because of its role in what we call broad trends in history. And in this case, dude ranching. Dude ranching was incredibly important uh, in the Bighorns, uh, in Wyoming in general, for uh, economic development, uh, also culturally, because it brought so many people particularly from the East Coast to this area to you know, learn about the West. Many of them settled here um, and that's us, basically. Um, so, so they're very, very important and this, this ranch was started right in the, the golden age of dude ranching, um, right when there was some, some trouble in the cattle market, uh, ranchers needed something to boost their own bottom line and um, and the idea of inviting you know those people who used to stay freeloaders you know used to stay for free charge them money it worked out really well um, it also pres has preserved a lot of traditions western traditions that might otherwise I mean ranchers don't use horses anymore but dude ranches do so um, so significant in history also significant in architecture, both for the kind of very typical arrangement that we have here. When you go outside, just notice the, the nice kind of circle around the lodge of guest cabins. There's a guest area. There's a, a service area that we don't really see that's back over that way. Back there, there are corrals and um, bunk houses for the, the help. and. Um, so this, it's a whole landscape, the setting, how the buildings are arranged, and the buildings themselves. And these very typical cabins that you see, except these were not that typical because they actually had baths with running water, which was quite nice. Um, and then this very, very unusual building that we're in right now. Um, so definitely significant in architecture. Uh, the next question we ask is, does it have integrity? So if I were um, someone who had been here in, in 1935 or 1940, and I came back today, could I say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember this place. You know, we slept in that cabin, and, and uh, I remember sitting around the, the fireplace, and, and yes, I mean, obviously it does have integrity. That, that has not changed, even though its use has changed, uh, it has integrity, uh, historic integrity. So um, the nomination uh, shared in college, uh, commission the nomination to the National Register. Uh, it goes through a review process at the state level, a state review board, and then it's reviewed at the national level by the National Park Service and it was placed on the National Register uh, this spring. Um, so, just to wrap up, um, back when Ann Pamela Cunningham was preserving uh, Mount Vernon, the thought of preserving a place with no ties to the founding of our nation or other major national events or figures would be inconceivable. Our reasons for preserving historic places have gone from this purely associative, patriotic, and to this aesthetic, cultural, social, economic even, um, and historic. We've gone from thinking about preserving individual buildings as um, monuments to districts and to whole landscapes like this one. From purely individual private efforts to a partnership that involves the federal government, sometimes state governments, private organizations, private individuals. Um, we now recognize the significance of all 
old buildings, not just um, all old buildings with history, I should say, um, not just the high style or, or you know, high class monuments. And we see this opportunity to reuse historic resources as a practical matter. Um, it just makes sense. You have this, this building, um, it's well built, uh, let's put it to a good use. Um, so let's put today's students into cabins built for dudes in the 1920s. Uh, probably most important is our understanding of preservation as this continuum, that, that we, our places, the places where we live and work and recreate are so much richer if, if they express the, all those years of our history. And we can do that through the built environment and through these collections of, of buildings that represent that history. Um, the human touch, this, this patina of age that we have right here. That's what makes historic places, places where we want to be. Uh, thank you, and I see the hammer and the placard ready back there. We received this historic designation in the spring, and I've been visiting with, with Mary I, since then about how to celebrate that, and we really decided to celebrate. In fact, many of you probably didn't know you were going to be able to participate in this today. We decided to celebrate this I, for exactly the reason that I, Northern Wyoming Community College District decided to buy Spiro Mountain Campus for education. So you are, have been here this morning for educational purposes. We've had wonderful, wonderful lectures, and thank you very much. And for also, uh, yesterday we had Harrison Woodall here working with our construction technology students, learning about log preservation. And you may not have noticed that there were ecology students from Sheridan College in the back of the room today listening to the, uh, to, through, to the first lecture. And so this is all about education. And preserving this opportunity for not only this generation but generations to come. And so many people here have had such a history with, uh, with Spiro uh, Wigwam, we now call it Spiro Mountain Campus, uh, but with this, uh, with this facility and this land and the Bighorns and many of them have worked tirelessly to bring it to the state that it's in and uh, we are enlisting additional, one, additional folks to help us as we move forward to really preserve this in, in the right way. So with that, I am going to hand over to Mary because she wrote, I wrote and encouraged us I, to get on the historic register the nail and the hammer. Oh my goodness. And <laughs> Wait, I can't put a nail in a historic building. <laughs> there are plenty of holes here. And to Trudy Munzik, who has been the director from the very beginning. In fact, I think she's the one that convinced Dr. Young that we should purchase this. And Trudy is now the on-site director, she and her husband, Dave. So this is the framed uh, certificate. So Mary and Trudy we have a place for you. It's right there. Just put a hole in it. It's okay. And we'll move it. We'll move aside. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I need glasses. I used to be good at this. There we go. 